Welcome, everyone. Take a moment to uh, let everyone get settled and welcome a few more, and then we'll get started. All right, well, let's go ahead and kick things off. Uh, I am Dan Jeline. I'm with the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. I'm delighted to welcome you back to the final episode, the final installment of our webinar series uh, where we've learned from um, folks in Australia, New Zealand about uh, improving pedestrian safety on urban arterials. Um, so we're specifically today going to get into some discussion about speed management, policies and practices that can help us um, rein in speeds uh, and, and improve traffic safety uh, through through targeting and looking specifically at speed. Um, so we've got a great panel lined up uh, to speak with you today about work here in the U.S. as well as um, uh, abroad. So let me uh, introduce you to them now, and then we'll go through a little bit of housekeeping and then get right into our presentations. Um, first, we're going to be hearing from Mark Cole, uh, who is the State Traffic Operations Engineer for the Virginia Department of Transportation. He leads VDOT's Traffic Operations Division, whose mission it is to ensure the safe, efficient, and reliable movement of people and goods on Virginia's transportation system. Uh, Mark has held several leadership positions with state and local transportation departments in Virginia and North Carolina, with a focus on the planning, design, construction of transportation projects, and the safety and operations of the transportation system. We're also joined by Anna Bray Sharpen, uh, who's Principal Advisor of Speed, Infrastructure, and Urban Mobility at the Wakakotahi New Zealand Transport Agency. She led a multidisciplinary team of authors to prepare the new National Speed Management Guide. And previously, Anna worked for the World Resources Institute Center for Sustainable Cities in Washington, DC, and the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in Brazil and Mexico. Lee Austin is also joining us today. Lee is the area engineer for the city of Austin, Texas, and represented uh, the National Association of City Transportation Officials on the global benchmarking study that we'll talk about today. She is the chair of the NACDO delegation to the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices and serves on the Markings Technical Committee. We're also joined by An Anisha Mukherjee, is the, who is the Speed Management Program Manager at FHWA's Office of Safety in Washington, DC. And prior to joining FHWA, uh, Ms. Mukherjee worked for the Maryland Department of Transportation, where she oversaw traffic operations and safety of the state highway network. And finally, we are joined by Sherry Schaffline of the Federal Highway Administration. Currently, as director of the Office of Human Environment, she supervises three teams that have responsibilities for financial oversight of the office research program, advancing multimodal connectivity, accelerating project delivery through application of context-sensitive design principles, implementing the transportation alternatives, scenic byways, and active transportation infrastructure investment programs, and administering procedures and standards for modifying the national highway system and the strategic highway network. Um, so I'll let our panel get right into the material that they've queued up uh, in just a moment. I just wanted to let you know a uh, little bit of housekeeping items. You can submit questions at any time. We hope that you'll do that because we've set aside about 30 minutes at the end of this webinar specifically to respond to those questions and have a bit of discussion with our panel. Um, we are archiving this webinar as we've archived others in this series. We've already got the slides posted online. I'll share a link with you uh, in a moment where you can find those. And we'll be posting the recording likely tomorrow morning. Um, so you can look back at that if you need to. Um, we have applied uh, the webinar for um, AICP CM credits for planners out there. You know how to claim those. We'll also be providing instructions for generating certificates of attendance so you can self-report other professional development hours after the webinar. And as always, we would prefer or recommend uh, that you review previous episodes in the series and sign up for webinars that PBIC will be hosting in the future. Uh, this is just a brief look here before we turn it over to Mark about the uh, schedule of the webinars so far. Again, we've taken parts one through three and held those webinars pre previously. We are now uh, part four, the final episode in the series, going to get into some topics and discussion about speed management. Um, so Mark, uh, we're ready to go whenever you want to pull your slides up. I think we'll be in good shape to continue on the presentation. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, just want to do a quick check to make sure that you can see everything okay. Yes, it looks great. Thanks, Mark. All right. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm excited uh, to be here with everyone today to talk about um, our study 
um, on improving pedestrian safety on urban arterials, uh, learning from Australasia. Uh, today, as Dan mentioned, is the fourth webinar um, in a series that we've been uh, doing over the past uh, month and a half, and we're going to focus on speed management. Um, so we had an um, exciting um, team who traveled to New Zealand and Australia a little over a year ago. Um, I was honored to be on that team, as well as um, a couple of the other speakers that you'll hear from today, uh, Sherry. Um, and Lee, um, who are going to be talking um, in a little while. Uh, we're also on the team, uh, as well as several others who you can see on the screen. Um, and we had a great time learning uh, from, from our friends in, in Australasia. Um, today, um, in addition to Sherry, Lee, and myself, uh, we're very honored to have a couple of special guests. Uh, the first of which is joining us from very early tomorrow morning. So um, Anna Bray Sharpen, uh, we're very excited that she's with us today and I'm looking forward to um, her, her content. I think it's gonna be excellent. Um, also Anisha from the Federal Highway Office of Safety uh, Speed Management. Uh, we're also looking forward to hearing what Federal Highway uh, is working on that can help us in this um, especially important area. Um, so if you're curious about the study and you haven't had a chance to read the report, um, you can use this QR code uh, or also Google uh, the title of the study uh, here uh, that you can see on the screen and you can download a copy for yourself. Uh, it's called Improving Pedestrian Safe, uh, Safety, um, Learning from Australasia. And so why did we do the study? Uh, well, um, as you probably know, uh, traffic deaths and pedestrian deaths in particular have been getting worse in the U.S. over the past um, decade, uh, while we've seen in other countries such as Australia and New Zealand, um, pedestrian deaths and traffic deaths are decreasing. Um, so the study looked at a variety of countries to determine who was doing really uh, well and much better uh, than the U.S. in the area of pedestrian safety. Um, and Australia and New Zealand uh, came to the top of a list. Um, and as you can see on the uh, chart on the right, uh, since 2010 um, in the U.S., pedestrian deaths have increased by 71% in the United States um, as compared to um, the decreases that we saw in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, so uh, the purpose of the study was to um, determine what we could learn from those countries who have similar context to the U.S., uh, but who are getting much better safety results. Um, and so a lot of um, our study uh, focused on the types of roads where uh, the pedestrian safety issues are occurring. Um, and we know that in the U.S., um, over half of all fatal crashes um, and six out of 10 fatal pedestrian crashes um, occur on principal and minor arterials in the U.S. So uh, these are uh, roads uh, that are trying to move a lot of traffic, but also serve a, lo a local function. Um, sometimes we call them strodes because they're trying to be both a street and a road. Uh, these are really uh, the streets, uh, these arterial roads uh, where we're having um, lots of pedestrian safety issues in the U.S. Um, and these are the types of roads that we wanted to learn from, from others, uh, some strategies for how we can uh, begin to see improvements um, here in this country. Um, so the safe system approach um, is an approach uh, promoted by Federal Highway Administration uh, that really focuses on uh, working as a team, um, a multi-sectoral approach to improve uh, safety um, of the travelers on our roadway systems. Um, so reducing uh, vehicle speed to mitigate kinetic energy um, is a big part of that approach um, in the safe roads component. Um, also separating vulnerable road users from motorized vehicles in time and space to minimize the number of opportunities for conflict and collision and injury or death. Um, also at speeds that are survivable um, if a pedestrian is involved in a crash. Um, and then also um, a focus on designing roads that suit their context. So, 
Um, if a road or a street is in an area where uh, there are a lot of um, pedestrians and cyclists, uh, making sure that the design accounts for that um, and um, has speeds that are slow enough uh, so that all those involved in potential crashes can walk away from those crashes. So um, several of the takeaways uh, that we had from the study is that pedestrian safety is foundational uh, for well-being and livability. Uh, we also um, learned about a number of holistic policy goals. Uh, we also uh, learned about a planning process uh, called movement in place, which is all about designing for context and making sure that uh, the right type of uh, design treatments and speed um, is used to match uh, what's going on along a, a stretch of, of road or street. Um, and we also uh, learned about how uh, New Zealand and Australia use uh, the road safety audit uh, process as a way uh, to complement and ensure uh, that speed management is built into uh, the roadway system. For some reason, Dan, my slides aren't advancing. So there they go. Okay. Um, all right. So in an earlier webinar, um, two, two webinars ago, uh, we spoke about the movement in place. Um, and, and that's something that if you're interested, you can um, uh, go to the PBIC website and watch that webinar if you weren't, weren't able to join us. Um, the last webinar a couple weeks ago um, focused on road safety audit, um, the road safety audit process. And then today we're talking about uh, speed management, which is closely um, integrated with road safety audits. Um, so this uh, shows uh, um, the range of speeds um, in a document in um, New South Wales, Australia. Um, and really what, what this is showing here is that uh, for streets with lower, um, lower speed limits, so these are more pedestrian-oriented uh, bicycle-traveled uh, uh, streets uh, where vulnerable road users are sharing the street with, uh, with um, drivers, um, and you have lower speeds, the design speed uh, matches the posted speed. Um, and then once you get into um, streets and roads that, that serve more of a movement purpose, uh, the default speed limits um, increase um, and the design speed is determined by the context um, of the roadway and the land use. Um, and then finally, um, for motorways or what we, we call interstates, um, design speed is 10 kilometers an hour higher than the posted speed. So it's really only those um, interstate motorway type roadways where design speed is uh, set as higher than the posted speed. Um, and here is um, a graphic from the speed management guide um, in New Zealand. I think um, Anna may also touch on this, but it, it talks about the four speed management principles. Uh, first being safety, second being the whole of the system, um, third being community well being, and fourth being movement in place. And really, to have good speed management, um, you need to have all four of those things, they complement one another. And uh, the one network framework. Uh, movement in place categories uh, that were, were talked about in one of the previous webinars, and I think Anna may touch on this as well um, when she goes through her part of the presentation. Uh, but basically, um, it's a system where, uh, based on if a road is more about moving traffic and moving uh, cars, um, it will have a higher speed limit. Um, as opposed to more um, activity streets or local streets, 
um, or streets that have more of a place component to it. Place meaning a mix of people, um, pedestrians, bicyclists, others, uh, where the speed limit um, in those areas should be, should be low. And another thing uh, that I think really um, is something I, I knew, but it really stuck at, uh, stood out to me um, on our trip to New Zealand, Australia, um, is just realizing and being reminded that streets do separate jobs, do different jobs based on where you are on the street. Um, so a corridor changes along their length in response to what's going on around it. Um, and that's an important thing that we need to not forget when it comes to um, how we plan and design our roads um, is to understand um, what's going on around the road um, and how the corridor is changing as it passes through a given uh, context. And so something that was pretty motivational to me that we saw um, in New South Wales, Australia, um, is this is their trend of traffic deaths uh, since 1970. Um, and they've seen a pretty consistent and steady uh, decrease um, over that time period, which is, uh, which is pretty encouraging. And in 2000, about the middle of the, the chart, um, they really started focusing on uh, speed management. Um, and you can see after that time, they've, they've continued a trend of, of decrease uh, traffic deaths on on their roads. And part of what they did, uh, which has helped drive, um, drive the needle for them and, and help uh, them build uh, speed management into their um, culture and their programs is they set up several key performance measures um, to track how they're doing with regards to speed management. So uh, the share of their urban roads with speed limits of um, 30 or less or the share of at-grade intersections um, where uh, they're designed at no more than, than 50 kilometers per hour, um, or uh, the number of vehicles and drivers compliant with the 40 to 60 uh, kilometer per hour speed limit on urban roads. So um, by measuring how they're doing uh, for each of these performance indicators, it, it's helped, helped them to ensure that uh, the downward momentum towards zero continues. And so I just wanted, before I turn it over to Anna, I wanted to share a few photos we saw on our trip um, to help get you thinking about um, some of the things we saw uh, related to speed management. Um, here are a couple of photos showing some vertical deflection uh, for speed management. On the right, you can see a raised crosswalk. On the left, uh, you see the end pavement um, speed limit markings, um, and at the intersection, the intersection actually raises up uh, to flush, um, you know, as you, as you approach the intersection. Uh, we also saw um, and learned about um, photo uh, speed enforcement um, and other types of, of camera enforcement um, in, in both countries. Uh, here's another photo uh, from New Zealand showing uh, the raised uh, intersection, but also uh, modal separation uh, with um, a space, dedicated space for cyclists, uh, for transit, for parking, uh, for travel lanes, uh, which helps to um, uh, manage the flow of people um, and also um, help keep the speed um, at a uh, optimal level. Here's another photo of a raised uh, crosswalk. Um, and here is a photo from uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, where uh, we're standing kind of on the side of a um, arterial street passing by a, an urban uh, neighborhood and uh, their way of helping slow traffic as you approach the more densely urban pedestrian area is to narrow uh, the roadway um, and to um, divide the road from a very wide road that it was before um, into parking and a narrow travel, travel lane to help moderate speed as you approach a slower zone. Uh, here's a more close-up look and you can see 
how the space has been partitioned um, and it necks down to uh, help the driver know that slower speeds um, are more appropriate in this area. Uh, here's a photo approaching uh, in, in advance of this location uh, where the speeds were, were 50. Um, and as you approach, uh, you can see the signs uh, with the lower 40 kilometer per hour speed limit and the indication of high pedestrian activity. Um, another thing that was interesting in this location, the previous photo was on the horizon of this photo, uh, as you can see in the distance, but um, traffic was also diverted. So we went from three lanes down to one lane through the intersection uh, with the other two lanes diverted uh, left or right onto the intersecting arterial street. Um, and again, the red light uh, speed camera is also uh, part of the solution. Um, but so far, we've looked at a number of locations that are, are fairly urban, um, but this isn't just something that is applied in urban or suburban areas um, in these countries. So uh, here is um, a pretty rural location of a principal arterial road, um, and the uh, photo after that, that road was um, completed. Um, so you can see how a more suburban, uh, rural context arterial road can also apply some of these same uh, principles with the separated shared use path on the left, uh, mobile speed cameras, um, and, and the signage uh, still here, plus a lane for buses and uh, two lanes in each direction for the general uh, traffic. So those are just a few uh, photos uh, that I wanted to share. Um, I think I have one, one more. Here's an intersection on an arterial uh, with the design uh, that uh, really controls the turning uh, speed through the intersection uh, to try to ensure that if any crashes happen there involving uh, vulnerable road users, that the speeds are slow uh, when those crashes happen, um, as opposed to much more sweeping um, turn lanes uh, particularly the right turn lanes that you might might see in the U.S. And so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and turn things over to Anna, uh, who's going to go into more depth about speed management in New Zealand. Thank you, Mark. Can everyone see and hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Great. Oh, they can't you can see, see me yet, and actually, your camera. Oh, you can't off. see me. Okay. We can Let's see your slides. Check that one. There you are. Here I am. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to be a part of this session. Um, particularly always glad to to be in a session with a focus on pedestrian safety because although. I've been spending the last three years uh, sort of living and breathing speed management as part of the team for uh, the New Zealand Transport Agency. Um, my uh, Most of my career prior was focused on safety and accessibility for people walking and biking. Um, and it was through that work that I got very focused on road safety and then zoomed in on speed management as one of the, the fastest and most effective ways that we can actually improve safety for everyone using our streets and roads, um, including people. Uh, walking. So um, I'm going to be talking today about the new framework for uh, speed management that we have established in Aotearoa New Zealand over the last three years or so. Uh, it formally came into play um, nearly 18 months ago now um, via a change in our legislation uh, in a, at a rural level. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about firstly today um, is the basically the, the circumstances that enabled this moment to take place. So we were really fortunate with the timing at a variety of levels. And for myself coming in um, into the organization uh, to write the guide, I was really, really lucky uh, in terms of all the amazing work that had gone on um, beforehand and was still going on uh, to set um, incredible uh, foundation for, for what we were able to establish. 
So first of all, of course, we had that international level direction and commitments, um, the sustainable development goals and, and the second decade of action on road safety, which had really um, uh, established uh, the need for um, road safety to be a key element of development and, um, and of course, the importance of safe system approach to road safety. Um, and then the Stockholm Declaration on Global Road Safety was really key because it was the first time that that magic number of 30 kilometres an hour in urban areas where there are vulnerable users was really enshrined in, um, in road safety practice um, and agreed upon at an international level. Um, and that declaration also made very clear the links between speed management and um, co-benefits such as uh, environmental um, livability um, benefits. Uh, so that really set a great a great scene for us um, at an international level to take an evidence-based approach to our speed management. Um, we then had a strong um, government direction uh, informed by our, our statement, general statement on land transport and our national land transport program, which identifies safety as a key element. Um, but then really uh, the, the crucial strategy was our road to zero strategy and action plan. So that was the first time that um, New Zealand actually embraced the Vision Zero approach uh, and set very clear targets for uh, road safety. So um, while we had a previous approach that was considered to embody the principles of safe system, um, it was lacking the targets uh, to, to motivate and, and monitor the follow through on that. And part of that Road to Zero strategy identified the need to tackle unsafe speeds in New Zealand um, uh, via a variety of approaches, including getting better speeds around, safer speeds around schools, um, an improved program for safety cameras or speed cameras, um, and a new regulatory framework for setting speed limits, which is where I came into the picture. So what that looked like at the level that I've been working at in Moka Kotahi is that, of course, we got our one network framework, our new movement and place-based approach to setting, categorizing our streets and roads, which has been an incredible tool for um, adding more nuance and alignment of safe and appropriate speed limits. Um, the land transport rule that came into play um, last year was the one that actually changed the process for setting speed limits. Uh, by our local road controlling authorities and our state highway road controlling authority, transitioning from a very lumbersome uh, process where any street uh, or road could it be changed away only on a case-by-case -case basis away from our defaults of 50 and 100 kilometres an hour. Um, so it required a tremendous amount of resources uh, and consulting um, for um single speed limit changes, um, when the reality is that currently over 90% of our speed limits are too high. So it just wasn't appropriate for the scale of change. So now under the new rule, um, each uh, road controlling authority needs to prepare a speed management plan with a 10-year um, vision and a three-year implementation program. And I came in to pull together the speed management guide, which draws on these, um, on these various different concepts and levels and um, provides us supporting information for um, how our road controlling authority should actually go about the speed management planning process. So another way of, uh, of looking at this, just to zoom in on the key components, we've got the land transport rule setting of speed limits 2022 that I mentioned establishes the speed management planning process. And this paired with the one network framework, which gave us the foundation of movement in place for the new process. And then these have been able to feed into the development of the speed management guide, which is a PDF document. It's also accompanied by an online geospatial tool called Mega Maps. And Mega Maps shows us every street and road in the country um, and provides a whole lot of information um, about those streets and roads relevant to speed management planning. Um, but most particularly, it provides the um, assessed uh, safe and appropriate speed limit for that, for any given location. So um, an analysis of what the speed limit ultimately should be. So one way of thinking about that is, oh, is that the guide is the why and the how of our safe and appropriate speed limits. And then Mega Maps gives the what, it gives that actual safe and appropriate speed limit um, as the output. And for people who want to understand more about how we got there, the guide provides that information. So just to go into a little bit more detail about the land transport rule, 
Um, the rule itself um, introduces their new approach that I mentioned to um, planning and consulting on speed limit changes. So that means that every local authority uh, either working on their own or together as part of their region um, needs to generate a network-based speed management plan. So looking at across their entire network rather than at individual streets um, and set a 10-year vision with or at a principal's level and a three-year implementation plan. Um, crucially, the rule disconnects speed limit setting from infrastructure changes. So this was a big change uh, for, for me, you know, having spent years um, talking with, with cities around the world about how, you know, we know that infrastructure is so crucial for actually really bringing those operating speeds down. But what we found in New Zealand is that when, under the previous framework, when it was required that infrastructure and speed limit changes happened at the same time, was essentially becoming a barrier to getting any change in our speed limits because the infrastructure changes required were often so expensive. Um, so what we've done now is uh, disconnected these so that speed limits can be set first as a foundation and then the impacts can be monitored across the network and infrastructure investment can be made where it will have the greatest impact on safety and operating speeds on the network. This is particularly important operating in an environment of you know, limited resources uh, and a large scale of change needed in terms of our speed limits. So that's really enabled the process to, um, to occur at scale and for infrastructure to be targeted where it's most needed. Um, as I mentioned, there's a target under road to zero for safe speeds around schools, and this is enshrined in the rule. So that's that um, our RCAs, our road controlling authorities, must make their best efforts to have safe speeds around 40% of schools by 2024 and all by the end of 2027. Um, these speed limits can be permanent or variable speed limits. Um, however, we strongly encourage people to focus on, um, on, on the opportunity to establish permanent speed limits where possible. Uh, and the rule establishes expectations for partnership with Māori. They've been traditionally left out of the speed management process, uh, and it's no coincidence that uh, Māori are, are then overrepresented in our deaths and serious injury statistics. Um, there are particular elements of Māori settlement and travel patterns that are very relevant to speed management planning. And so um, the rule now enshrines the requirement to engage with Māori right from the beginning of the process to better understand these and account for them in speed management planning. So as Mark mentioned, this, the One Network Framework is an approach that's tra transitioned us away from a uh, traditional hierarchical based approach to, to categorizing our streets and roads based on vehicle volume um, and introduces, introduces a matrix based approach considering both movement and place. Um, this allows a level of nuance uh, in, in the way we understand our streets and roads that we didn't have before. It's particularly relevant um, in those locations, like Mark mentioned, where um, such as arterials or where state highways go through uh, small rural communities where the volume of traffic is significant, um, but there is also a significant place value that traditionally hasn't been taken into account. Uh, so it presents a real opportunity to add nuance and to consider our corridors in sections um, and sections and treat each section according to its own context rather than as one continuous and homogenous whole. So the guide itself, just to briefly um, uh, show you, is uh, divided into four sections. So we've got um, the sort of general overview, our key principles for speed management, uh, the, pro the section that outlines the setting of speed limits framework, which is basically the rationale for how we assess those and set the, um, those speed limits, uh, and then a process-based section about how to actually develop plans um, we had a lot more to say, so we also have an appendix which uh, dives into some of the other key topics that come up a lot, like um, communications and engagement, partnership with Māori, and provides more, more general context as well for uh, the need for speed management in New Zealand. And this is just a screenshot of what you might see uh, looking at mega maps. So um, as I mentioned, uh, it's a geospatial tool. It's got a, a, a tremendous amount of layers, um, so you can access a whole lot of information in there. Uh, and one of the key layers is what we call the high benefit layer. Um, this is what an example of it that you see here. What this layer shows is a combination of the um, corridors that uh, have the greatest opportunity to reduce uh, deaths and serious injuries by reducing uh, the speed limit, um, but also all of the locations where there are schools and a hundred meter radius around those schools and areas where there are higher concentrations of vulnerable road users. Um, which you'll see uh, essentially starts to cover most of our urban areas. Um, 
So the reason for providing this layer is just that, as I mentioned, about 90% of our streets and roads uh, are currently um, have speed limits that are too high. So the scale of change required is, is substantial. The pace of that change is set by every individual road controlling authority. And, and there, are many, there are many different points along the spectrum of, uh, of road safety and speed management. Um, so this layer is to help them if they want to consider how they might prioritize uh, change within their own region. Um, Mark introduced the principles of speed management that we enshrined in the guidance. Um, these actually drew from a, a draft World Bank and World Resources Institute um, guide on speed management, uh, which should be released uh, later this year, hopefully. Um, we were able to take those principles, review and adapt them to our New Zealand context. Uh, and one of the really key things about putting these in the guidance is that it's about changing the conversation or perhaps expanding the conversation from one that traditionally has only focused on the opportunity to reduce deaths and serious injuries uh, to one which acknowledges and, um, uh, and elevates all of those other opportunities that come from uh, setting safe and appropriate speed limits. Um, uh, for example, um, those safe speed limits around schools and in the school catchment areas that provide the opportunity for children to walk to school more um, uh, independently and uh, and have more of an active lifestyle. So that's the kind of thing where if we were only measuring based on our deaths and serious injuries, it actually would struggle to make it a priority because uh, in front of schools is not necessarily a location of current high um, high crash rates or injury rates. However, we know there are all kinds of wider benefits from getting those safe speeds around schools, uh, the mode shift um, and uh, ch uh, childhood independence that they unlock. Uh, and schools safety can act as a catalyst for uh, wider speed limit changes in communities over time as well. So we use the term safe and appropriate speed limit a lot. Um, you hear it many, many times throughout this presentation. The definition that we have of a safe and appropriate speed limit is one that is safe according to the standard set by safe system approach, but also appropriate. And that means being appropriate for community well-being objectives, for the movement and place function, design and infrastructure of the street or road. So essentially all of those human elements, uh, not just survivability, but also how people are using that street and road and how we want them to be able to use it in the future. So those survivable speed limits, you're probably familiar with some version of this graphic. Um, we're working with uh, understanding of survivable speed limits of around 30 kilometers an hour for locations where we have people outside of vehicles, 50 where there are side on collisions possibly, and 70 to 80 where there are risks of head on crashes. Um, and when we went out for engagement with the sector, uh, on the development of this guidance, we heard very, very clearly that practitioners wanted speed limit advice that linked uh, directly to these speed to these survivability thresholds. Um, the previous framework linked to them somewhat, but also took a pragmatic approach where um, they could be counterbalanced by uh, by a lower volume of traffic. Um, whereas now um, the framework links to these um, uh, based entirely on on crash, possible crash type. Uh, so it was really interesting and rewarding to get that feedback from the sector. Um, now I touched upon this a little bit. I mentioned we have uh, a layer in Mega Maps that talks about the roads, uh, streets and roads where we have the greatest opportunity for um, death and serious injury reductions. Um, it's actually a huge opportunity. We know that on, uh, addressing only uh, the top 10% of our network would in fact get us around 80% of our full potential um, deaths and serious injury reductions that we would get if all speed limits in New Zealand were allied with the safe and appropriate speed limit. So there's huge opportunity there, um, both uh, by our state highway uh, road controlling authority and also our local authorities to have, to have a rapid and significant impact on deaths and serious injuries. Um, but as I mentioned, we're also really um, keen to expand the conversation. Uh, and so it's also really important to keep in mind that managing us presents a huge opportunity for creating um, catalysts in our urban areas um, in particular. We're reducing those vehicle speeds, um, unlock other benefits like improved air quality, a safer environment overall, uh, and, mo and, uh, and, and more tr safe active transport options. 
which in turn reduce um, that ne need for uh, vehicle dependence and uh, and start to reduce our vehicles kilometer vehicle kilometers traveled and um, and exposure. So this is an example of uh, of of how um, the new framework has been applied. Um, this is one that came through recently from a rural area in the South Island. Um, so on the left there, this is an example of how they were um, managing safety around schools previously. So under the previous framework, they were enabled to have a, a single variable speed limit around each of their schools at the school gate that could operate for around 20 minutes in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, and so they had three of those operating on a trial basis. Um, but what they what they realized when they started to look at the new framework is that, of course, the, the larger safety issues aren't actually in front of the school. They're on uh, children or young people's walk to school. Most children are injured within one and a half, uh, within 500 meters and one and a half kilometers of school, not in front of the school gate. And so if this was to have a meaningful impact on children's safety and on the opportunity to actually walk or bike to school, they need to take a broader catchment area approach. So that's what we see on the right there. Um, the new uh, the new approach in their speed limit plan, speed management plan, will be to make um, establish a radius around all three of these schools of 30 kilometers an hour, permanent speed limit, retaining one variable speed limit on the arterial. So that's a fantastic tr transition um, to permanent uh, and catchment wide uh, safe speeds. And we're seeing um, the beauty of this process and the framework is that it's so flexible that we're seeing uh, different road controlling authorities around the country taking different but equally safe approaches to um, to setting speed limits around their schools, depending on their own context, where they are in the process already. So just um, touching upon the One Network framework a little bit more. This has been really key, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of being able to address some of the nuance in our um, in our system. In particular, our lo locations such as um, uh, main streets, as they go, um, that are part of our highway network, um, peri urban roads that have traditionally been a real challenge in terms of of, of safe speed limits and um, managing that compared with transit. Um, and our urban arterials, which actually may be made up of a whole lot of different um, pieces of the puzzle, we, activity streets, main streets, and city hubs. So it's been a fantastic opportunity to really look more closely at how those speed limits might be set through those areas. So just a recap on our safe and appropriate speed limits framework. The framework itself follows those proven safe system thresholds, as I mentioned. Um, so what that mainly means in practice is that the guidance mainly indicates a, a, a much larger need for 30 kilometer an hour speed limits in um, areas where there are vulnerable users and 80 kilometer an hour speed limits on undivided rural roads and highways where there are is a potential for head on collision. The framework has introduced that movement in place to the speed limit setting, um, which allows us to much more clearly link um, our safe and speed appropriate speed limits to adjacent land use and the types of road users that we would expect to be, be present or would like to be present in any given location. And the guidance takes into account infrastructure. So a variety of elements of something called our infrastructure rating, which I'll go into more in the next slide. Um, and the presence of safety infrastructure to manage speeds or avoid certain crash types can justify a, a higher speed limit. However, as I mentioned, infrastructure is not required to be implemented at the same time as a speed limit change. And I think it's also it's really important to 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 emphasize that um, the expectation is for incremental change over time, set at a pace of those local road controlling authorities, eventually reaching safe and appropriate speed limits across the network. The scale of change is huge. This process enables it to happen uh, more quickly than it could under the previous process, but it will still take time. So this is another way of looking at uh, at how that framework works. We have we. The inputs to our safe and appropriate speed limit assessments are our survivable speed limit thresholds, the category of the One Network framework, and then a series of infrastructure um, elements that are available um, in our national data set. So this can feed directly into mega maps. So that's things like the alignment of the road, um, vehicle volume, the carriageway width, um, the access density, and the land use. That's what we call the baseline data because it's all available um, uh, at a national um, data level and can input directly into mega maps. 
So that gives us our assess safe and appropriate speed limit, which Mega Map spits out. But what's also really important for that process is that local knowledge, especially the presence or the planning of additional safety infrastructure, such as bike lanes, um, median barriers, or um, or pedestrian uh, safety infrastructure, such as improved um, crossings that mitigate speeds. Um, this is a, uh, things like the pedestrian infrastructure are especially important because they don't currently feed into our national level data sets, so we can't capture them in mega maps at the moment. So that's where that local knowledge becomes really crucial. So then these things combined enable our local authorities to confirm or change the safe and appropriate speed limit and embed that into their speed management plan. Just got a couple more slides here. Um, this, I encourage you, if you're interested in the in the detail behind uh, the inputs into those speed limits, there's also much more detailed um, tables within the guidance. This There's this table and then there's a further detailed one which covers uh, the types of infrastructure we would expect to see. Um, but essentially what these tables do is they show clearly how each of the different categories under the One Network Framework are linked to a safe and appropriate speed limit range. We would expect in general that the speed limit will start at the lower end of this range and only move to a higher end if it's justified due to the level of safety infrastructure that is present. Uh, so in our urban areas, that's going to look like mainly 30s, unless there are things like separa separated cycleways um, and raised pedestrian platforms that manage the potential severity of a crash at possible conflict points. And then um, for our, our rural roads, our higher speed roads, uh, that will generally look like the, um, the middle of these. So most of them will look like 80 kilometers an hour. Uh, unless there's a presence of additional safety infrastructure and particularly me particular median barriers that prevent the possibility of uh, um, head-on collision. So just a few things to keep in mind as, uh, that I wanted to highlight from the presentation. Our safe and appropriate speed limits are our desired end state, but as I've mentioned, it will take time. It's also possible that speed limit changes can be phased. This might be geographical phasing, as we're seeing mainly at the moment, but could also be in terms of the limit itself. So we encourage, rather than no change, it will be better to achieve uh, a change from 100 to 90 as a transitional phase to get to 80, or 80 to 70 as a transitional phase to get to 60, 50 to 40 on the way to 30. Um, and that's enabled under the process as well. And we're still seeing significant safety benefits, even with those smaller speed limit changes. Um, as I mentioned, we've got highest benefit areas that road controlling authorities can um, prioritize as part of this transition. Um, speed limit changes do not have to take into account the current meet operating speed. This should be monitored after the change has been made. And then additional speed management changes can be applied where they're most needed on the network. Uh, so that's that whole disconnection of speed limit changes and infrastructure that I mentioned. And finally, our variable speed limits uh, can be appropriate to support permanent, safe and appropriate speed limit changes. So traditionally, these have been used as a bit of a band-aid uh, to address safety, specific safety issues. Um, they are still, when it was very difficult to change the permanent speed limit, there's still places where they can be appropriate, um, but this should always be considered in, um, in addition to a safe permanent speed limit change. So just wrapping up, um, this is a huge, huge change for us in New Zealand. As I mentioned, we have the framework in place now, but the actual changes on the street and streets and roads are, are, are um, still a relatively slow process. It's a huge perception change, and it's a really big change, not only for the public and for our elected officials, but also for, for those of us ourselves working in this sector. Um, movement in place is a very big change in how we consider our streets and roads and these survivability thresholds and, and leading with safety rather than leading with an approach based on compliance are all really big changes. So it will take time, um, but we know that big changes have happened in road safety before. We've had huge cultural changes in terms of seatbelt use, um, in terms of um, uh, drink driving uh, and blood alcohol levels, um, and even in terms of changing specific road rules to better align with international rules over time. So these are all things which which people were very fearful and concerned about at first that have um, have turned out very well and become normal very quickly. So we look forward to um, to getting through that transition in the speed limit space. So thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Anna. Really appreciate that. Um... I just wanted to cut in and as Mark is bringing the screen back uh, for the rest of the presentation to say that 
Um, we've got some great questions so far that you're submitting. Please continue to do that as we move through. I think we're going to transition now to uh, hear about how we're applying some of this uh, in the United States. So, um, Mark, we've almost got your slides up and uh, we'll get right into it. Oh, Lee, that's right. Uh, Lee Austin from Austin, Texas will be presenting next about what they're doing in their neck of the woods. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Lee Austin from Austin, Texas. I'm an area engineer there, and I had the honor of accompanying the, the crew to go visit New Zealand and Australia to look at what was happening overseas. And I'm going to take it from the, the macro that Anna was just covering as far as like nationwide policy, just some smaller things that we're doing locally um, to the micro. And I will say that none thing I'm showing here was directly inspired from the report, but it's a takeaway. It's it's all in keeping with the recommendations of the report. And so it was reassuring to see that where we're headed in Austin seems like it's in track, on track and in alignment with what the current safe systems approaches were. My big takeaway from that was from the report that there were no magic bullets. They just started the process 20 years ago and now they're reaping the rewards and hopefully we can get there and it won't take us 20 years. Um, so very quickly to set the scene, just if you're not familiar with Austin, um, we're the 10th largest city, um, but we're only the 26th lar largest metro area. And not to pick on Houston, but we have less density than Houston, which is famously a very suburban city. We are also a very suburban city. We have a nice little downtown shown on the right, but most of our city is suburbs and arterials. We're seeing a 3% yearly population increase. And honestly, that's been for the past like 50 years. We've always been a boom town. So that's 30% increase in population almost every decade. And with that, of course, we're seeing an company rise in crisis of fatalities. Also, the, the rise everybody saw during COVID and the speeding, everybody saw the same thing we saw it as well. Um, so if you go ahead and get hit next slide. Okay, and just real quick, so you guys know the background of what we're dealing with when we're trying to apply some of the changes that we wanna see is our regulatory climate, which is by state law, we have to follow when we're setting speeds, we either have a prima facie, which is 30 miles per hour for a city street, or we have to actually do an investigation to set an actual speed limit. And it actually references the text dot procedure for establishing speed zones. And that one's very specific about you should base it primarily on the like 85th percentile speed. So that's where we're coming from as far as like the background there. And then I just want to add, because photo enforcement has been a big topic of discussion in some of the previous webinars, that we are actually going the opposite way. Red light cameras were prohibited in 2019. They were previously allowed in 2007. Photo enforcement for speeding was was made um, was prohibited. So right now in our climate, photo enforcement doesn't seem to be something that we can take advantage of. Although when I was researching that, me and the safety officer noticed that the the prohibition against cameras to enforce speeding actually only applies to municipalities. So we're like, hey, can we get the county to help us out on this one? We don't know. We're going to investigate that one further. We we're excited to see that. And go ahead and get the next slide. Okay, so now we're into some of the stuff that we've actually done. And this one seems almost embarrassing to mention because it's kind of a no-brainer, but we hadn't really looked at our arterials in a very long time. We were in a very reactionary phase. Our arterial speeds were set from speed studies years and years ago, and we only actually looked at them when we had like a crash or something to deal with. And that was kind of dumb, honestly. So we systematically looked at every single arterial we had in the urban core, and that's a, a quick graphic there on the right. And we definitely, you can see some outliers. We had some 50 mile per hour streets some 45 mile per hour streets. And then we collect the data and did individual speed studies for all the streets, because it's not that many for the big arterials, and applied US limits too. And even though we had the, the instruction to use the proce procedures for establishing speed zones from TxDOT, we felt like US limits too had enough data and defensibility behind it that we could use it and be defensible. Um, and of course, US limits too takes in a lot of different factors, a lot more context space. And so using that, we were able to get lower speeds. Well, some we just got lower speeds because the streets had changed and we should have looked at them way sooner, but we were also able to go a lot lower speeds because the US limits two versus the 85th percentile. So that was our first big push is let's just re-examine how fast our arterial is on. And I would, I would encourage everybody to do that. We should not have waited so long. Um, okay, next slide. And then the next attack we took was we knew it was unrealistic to have to do a speed study for every single street we wanted to stop to drop. And the ma vast majority of our neighborhood streets were all 30 miles per hour, which felt too fast for our residential streets. So we took all the data we had from Austin streets from, you know, a decade or so of traffic counts for traffic calming initiatives, et cetera, 
and, and kind of looked at it and said, okay, what are the things that are changing the speeds? And really width had a giant effect on it. And so did some other cues such as on-street parking utilization and driveways. Um, signs didn't really make very much difference. It was context. Um, if streets were like 36 feet or less, we were starting to see a yield flow occur. So using that, we felt like we could make a case that we could describe streets that met certain characteristics should be at a certain speed. And if you go to the next slide here, um, that's what we did. We said, okay, we want to establish, and when we change speed limits in Austin, we have to go to council, so it's kind of a big deal. We established through city ordinance that streets that met the characteristics we defined before, which were streets 36 feet or less in width, they had residential frontage, et cetera. Based on the speed study that encompassed streets that were similar, could meet the 25 mile per hour speed limit. And legal said that was perfectly fine. They felt like that was defensible enough as far as having enough of an engineering study on file to justify lowering the speed limit from the prima facie that was still in compliance with state law. And so that was exciting for us because before the idea of having to do a speed study in all these streets individually was was hugely onerous and not realistic, but this was a way we could approach it. I will say part of the reason 25 was that the, the limit used is because state law is very specific that we can't drop speeds below 25 miles per hour. That may be changing. There was a bill this last legislative session that proposed dropping it to 20 being the floor. Um, it passed the Senate, but not the House, but we're hopeful it'll come back up again. Um, and the second point on this slide is just that for streets between 36 and 40, the way the ordinance is written, we can go ahead and do an individual study and drop it without having to go back to council. So that's also a nice perk for us because otherwise all our speed limits have to be council. And it's always a, a bit of a, a, a lift. Okay, go ahead. Next slide, slide please, please. Excuse me. Okay, downtown. We did a similar thing. Our downtown is kind of the square there in the middle in that Almost every street is controlled by either a, every intersection is controlled by either a signal or a always stop. And we have a slower progression through downtown intentionally. We actually aren't even seeing 30 mile per hour in the sampling of streets that we had. So we could justify making a blanket 25 for all of our downtown grid because we had enough data collected to show that it was applicable. And I think it was important for us that the data that we had was all awesome specific data. We weren't basing this on a very, you know, pie in the thigh sky. This is what happened in this small New England town. This is like, this is Austin specific data that's completely relevant to what we're trying to achieve. And so we did this as well. We have neighborhood streets and downtown streets are a blanket 25 that we can just post. And that was a, a big help to setting speeds for the context. Okay, um, next slide, please. I'm gonna make a quick plug for my favorite traffic calming device in the entire world. And it's super relevant to speeds and it's super relevant to the point of the study, which was pedestrian fatalities. I love refuge islands, they are great. Um, we get a great safe crossing for pedestrians and we also get speed mitigation if we design them well. This one's not the best example, but if you have horizontal deflection and you have vertical friction, people slow down and they yield. We are getting yielding on comparable to RFB, sometimes greater. Um, when I do a design for one, I make my design speed below posted. So if the street is 30 miles per hour, I can design it for 20. And then I can post an advisory speed plaque, which is totally MUTCD compliant of 20 and tell people, hey, go slower. And the, the genius of that is that a lot of people don't understand the difference between regulatory signs and advisory signs. And so they think that's the speed limit. So that's another great benefit of doing the refuge island design. And it's also place making. The neighbor adjacent to this one has adopted it and he does things that are probably a little excessive in the right of way, but it's it's nice to know the community really enjoys these. And they tie my minor materials that are probably too small to put a pedestrian hybrid beacon on back together. So we're, we're joining back together neighborhoods. So it's my favorite technique ever. I had to put a plug in it. I plug it every single session I give. Okay, next slide, please. And my last example is just a quick one of a pilot we've done that's been an interesting, interesting example that I think is a great representative example of movement and place as a street changes over time and you need to reconsider the context. And so Barton Springs started out 40 years ago, or not 40 years, in 1940s, like a two lane, tiny county road. Back in the um, the like early 50s, it was widened to a four lane, undivided arterial, unimproved, just 
you know, no curb and gutter, just shoulders. And that's the way it was when I moved to town in the early 90s. It was an unapproved four-lane arterial. People went too fast. But the context had changed a lot. There'd been a lot of stuff that made it very urban. If you see the kind of beige building past the red sign back there, that's the original Chewy's. If you, any of you guys know Chewy's, the Mexican restaurant, it's a giant chain now. That's the first one ever. It was right there. So we were starting, starting to see a lot more use. In like the early 2000s, I think like 2001, it was made into this, this divided arterial of curb and gutter. So a lot more of an urban cross section. Um, it's the main access to a very large park, which if you ever have attended the Austin Sea Limits Music Festival, you've been on the street because it's right at the end of it. It also connects to a limited access highway. Um, as I said, it's become more and more urban with, with condos and restaurants being developed along it. The ADT, I put 30,000 on here and that's what it previously was. Um, that was pre-COVID. Post-COVID, it was really closer to about 23K. So it had dropped. It's never quite rebounded from COVID. And the 85th percentile was 37 miles per hour. I don't know what the design speed for this road was when they, they put in the curb and gutter, but I suspect it was 40 or 45 because people go way too fast. It's way too comfortable. And I mentioned the yielding behavior for pedestrian refuge islands. I saw no yielding at this crosswalk ever. It's it's You get a place to, to refuge in the middle, but nobody would ever yield for you. With all those factors, we were seeing crashes. And that's the, the, the little graphic on the top, which is over the last five years, 11 serious injuries and 36 other injuries. And what really precipitated this pilot for us was, if you see that red sign, it says Hola Mode, that's a Thai ice cream trailer. A car left the road at a high rate of speed and plowed into a line of people waiting to get ice cream. Thank God nobody died, but that was a big wake up call. And we got a lot of outcry from the community that they wanted to see us do something to the street. Um, I will also say, I can take no credit for this whatsoever. I was hugely skeptical as an engineer. I'm like ADT close to 30,000 or even 25. That's insane. That's way outside the parameters of a road diet. We're going to like torpedo our entire Vision Zero bicycle program because this is a horrible idea to do anything this is street. It's too vital. We don't have any good alternatives because it's a geographic layout of Austin. I don't think this is going to work. That was my mindset and it was wrong. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, this is after, and this is the exact same location. What we did was we took the outside lane, we made a buffered bike lane, we did it with paint and candlesticks. It's a pilot, so it could be removed. We use these, we call them armadillos, but they're a Ziegler project product that has like kind of bumps here. Um, that was partly from some concerns with the fire department and partly for our, our transit authority and how they can access their bus stops. Um, on the right hand side, we had a gigantic change in vehicles traveling egregiously. And you can see it on the right-hand side, huge, huge success. Because it's only one lane, you can't pass people. The 85th went from 37 to 31 miles per hour. I think it's 32 in the other direction. And then you ask, okay, how about travel times? It must be hellacious to get through there. Nope. Look at that graph on the bottom right there. The orange is before and the blue is after. And we saw very few changes here. Um, it actually got better. Our arterial management guys worked really hard on this to progress the signal timing through there and to make up for the um, the, the lack of the extra capacity. And, and it's operating fabulously. And then somebody else might say, well, did everybody stop going that way? Did you lose your volume? Nope. We lost about 6% of the volume that was there before. So 6% about 23K. So still, most people are choosing to go this way. It didn't really kill the volume. And it's just operating very, very, very well. Like I said, I was I was the biggest skeptic around there, and it it really worked. It was a it was a game changer for us, and it's still a pilot because of some internal stuff in the city. But I'm really hopeful it will maintain its 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 status here because it's it's a, just a prime example of how a street changes and evolves over time, and the success it can it can can have. And I guess next slide, just real quick here, which is I don't know where the next slide is. There we go. This is during the Austin City Limits Festival. It's kind of crazy, but we have all our modes using it. We've got the horses, we've got the pedicabs, we've got the electric cabs, those cars behind those cars. Um, it's been a tremendous success for us. And that was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. That was really exciting. And um, I, I love pedestrian refuge islands too. So thanks for those good examples. I um, wanted to very briefly, before we turn things over to Federal Highway um, and Anisha, wanted to just talk about at the state level um, how um, in Virginia we are trying to use some of what we learned on the study um, in our day-to-day -day work. 
Um, so first, um, we've adopted the safe system approach as part of our strategic highway safety uh, plan in Virginia a couple years ago. Um, and we're working to incorporate safe systems principles and road safety audits throughout the project life cycle. Um, so that's something that I'm working on uh, with our state design engineer and state planner. Um, we're also um, working with that same uh, group of leadership to discuss uh, design speeds based on context um, to promote safe speeds for all for all road users. So um, similar to the to what we heard from from Anna um, and certainly what you um, read and learn as you get into safe system approach, uh, trying to promote a safe speed um, for all road users uh, based on context. And uh, we hope to do that and adjust our, our design speeds. Um, the next thing we're doing is we're also in the middle of a big update to our speed study policy. So once a road's already in place um, and you need to study that road to determine the appropriate speed limit, uh, we're also looking at including uh, target speeds based on the, the type of roadway as well. Um, and an exciting thing in Virginia is a uh, year before last, we did get legislation, which now allows us to use speed enforcement or speed safety cameras in school zones um, and in work zones. Uh, so we're <clears throat> um, hoping to use the data from those deployments over the next several years to see how, how that um, helps with speed uh, compliance, um, and uh, hopefully that will help us maintain and build support for speed safety cameras um, in Virginia. Um, so now I'm going to turn things over uh, to Anisha uh, uh, with uh, Federal Highway Speed Management Program. Anisha? Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Anisha Mukherjee, and I'm excited for this opportunity to share some of the great work of my colleagues uh, and the Federal Highway Speed Management Program. Uh, speeding, as we know, is a cross-cutting issue in the, in the United States. And despite several uh, you know, years of progress that has been made in transportation safety, uh, speeding-related fatalities still account for 29% of all traffic fatalities. Next slide. So the US DOT's NRSS uh, or National Roadway Safety Strategy has adopted the safe system approach as a guiding paradigm. And it includes several strategies to implement a robust multimodal uh, speed management program. And Federal Highway Speed Management Program aims to deliver that uh, through a combination of technical assistance, education, outreach, and training uh, in cooperation with our other DOT partners. And over the years, we've been promoting uh, speed management countermeasures by creating uh, effective resources for practitioners. And some of the major ones are highlighted here, uh, like the traffic calming e-primers, uh, noteworthy speed management practices, and some of our newer um, resources, which uh, are the last three on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to kind of go over some of the uh, more important ones and highlight them. Uh, for example, the speed management e-primer for rural transition zones and town centers uh, is a free resource. It has six easy uh, to follow modules and several case studies. Uh, it illustrates about 14 different types of speed management countermeasures, which are suited for rural transition zones and town centers. Uh, it presents re research on the mobility and safety effects of speed management countermeasures for passenger cars, commercial vehicles, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, and agricultural vehicles, uh, which frequent uh, roadways in and around uh, uh, rural communities. Next slide. Um, the Traffic Calming E-Primer is another free online resource with eight different Sorry about that. Um, sorry. Uh, the Traffic Calming ePrimer is another free online resource with eight uh, distinct modules and several case studies. Uh, this ePrimer illustrates uh, 22 different types of traffic calming measures and provides details of uh, research 
on the effects of these measures on the mobility and safety of, on passenger vehicles, emergency response, public transit, uh, waste uh, collection vehicles, and pets and bikes. So one thing you notice, uh, one recurring theme here is uh, case studies and research. So most of our resources, uh, we try to provide you with a lot of case studies, which are, which we've been told is very helpful for stakeholders. And it's, it's uh, data driven and based on research. So those are some recurring themes for most of our resources. Next slide, please. Uh, one of federal highway's key initiatives, as some of you may know, is the Proven Safety Countermeasure Initiative, and transportation agencies are strongly encouraged to uh, consider these uh, and implementation of the, these proven safety countermeasures to accelerate the achievement of their uh, lo the local safety goals. And in next slide, please. And in 2021, uh, we added three proven speed management uh, countermeasures. Um, they are the appropriate speed limit for all road, road users, because we know addressing speed is fundamental to the safe system approach, uh, variable speed limits, and speed safety cameras. Next slide, please. Uh, so talking of speed safety cameras, earlier this year, Federal Highway and NHTSA issued the Speed Safety Camera Program Planning and Operations Guide. Uh, it, we commonly call it the SSC Guide. Uh, and this is an update to the 2008 uh, guidelines. Uh, we, we know that speed safety cameras have been shown to reduce fatal crashes by up to 37%. However, 25 states and DC have state, are the only ones who have state laws or city ordinances permitting SSCs. So what it tells us is that there's a, a great potential for widespread deployment of these countermeasures. And um, the SSC guide is a great resource in this situation for uh, jurisdictions that may be interested in establishing a SSC program. And the guide provides um, information on the planning, implementation, operation um, of an SSC program especially in school areas and construction zones, where it's uh, relatively easy to build support for such a program. And uh, throughout the SSC guide, uh, I just wanted to point out the speed safety cameras is presented as just one part of a broader speed management program. Next slide. Uh, another informational report that was published this year is the safe system approach uh, for speed management. And um, this is uh, one that is very near and dear to my heart. I might be biased because I was deeply involved with it. Uh, but uh, the reason why I think it's very important is because the safe system approach places the onus of establishing uh, an appropriate posted speed limit on the roadway designer and operator. So how does it, how does a uh, operator do that? How does a jurisdiction go ahead and establish a speed management plan? Uh, that uh, is safe system approach compliant. And this, these were some of the questions that we asked ourselves while developing this report. Uh, so in this report, we explain uh, impacts of speed on traffic safety. We explored the link between speed management and the safe system approach. And we introduced what, uh, what uh, is, is essentially a five-stage safe system approach for speed management framework. And yes, as I mentioned before, there are case studies uh, that demonstrate how agencies uh, within the US and internationally have been able to overcome some of the institutional barriers and rally behind uh, the safe system approach uh, and uh, enact speed management programs uh, with proven measurable reductions in operating speeds and crashes. Next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also uh, do a lot of training. Um, the, we, and this is an example of a recent training that was um, has been uh, uh, uploaded and is made available free of cost through the National Highway Institute portal. And uh, it is a comprehensive course on all things speed management. It's reflected in the length, it's about 10 hours, uh, but uh, uh, again, as with the developers here, I've taken the course myself, and I can tell you the developers have done a great job in uh, making it not only engaging, but they keep the spotlight on the role that speed management has in saving lives. Uh, this course has been sort of designed as a precursor to a more in-depth, tailored, 
instructor-led training, which can be requested if an agency and the staff have finished the 10-hour web-based training and would like, like a more thorough um, instructor-led course. So next slide, please. And finally, I just wanted to spotlight some of the technical assistance uh, that the speed management program pro provides to states and local uh, uh, tribal agencies. Um, 43 states uh, across the nation have identified speeding or speed management in their strategic highway safety plans, either as a standalone emphasis area or as part of another emphasis area, such as high risk, uh, you know, behavior, driving, um, aggressive driving, et cetera. So we have been providing direct technical support uh, to state and local agencies to develop uh, and implement jurisdiction-wide speed management uh, program plans. And with this, uh, what our contractor works one-on-one -on -one with the states and locals to review uh, the policies, the guidance, the practices related to speed safety and speed management. They help identify speeding and speed-related um, safety problems and locations. And then bring in the you know all the stakeholders, be them uh, from you know enforcement, engineering, judiciary, uh, together, and come up with a plan. Uh, so far, we have provided this sort of assistance to about ten jurisdictions and develop uh, very specific, tailored uh, speed management action plans for them. And these are uh, available on our website. So this, I think, brings me, next slide please, to the end of my presentation. Here's my information. If you would like more information, please uh, reach out. And I have to finally re leave you with this disclaimer um, before I turn it over to Shelly. Thank you so much. Well, th thank you, Anisha. I appreciate all the great information that's been shared today. So we are now at the end of our kind of webinar series where we have really pushed out the content, the guest speakers, and been promoting the recommendations uh, that we have compiled in these three goal areas. So we have the responsibility as a team and within federal highways to try to put together an implementation plan now that looks at opportunistic uh, things coming up where we can continue to promote these recommendations. And you'll see on the left a number of opportunities that exist right now. We hope that there's not much holding you back in your organization or state or area to start implementing pieces of this. But as you can see, there's really a holistic approach and we've got to, for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the long run, putting it in the sequence of linking land use and transportation with context, moving into the road safety audits and integrating speed management really gets you to the greatest bang for your buck at the scale that we need it in the United States to bring our uh, numbers down for fatalities and serious injuries, as well as have all those community benefits that have been discussed. So you'll see on the left, a number of those opportunities, state and metropolitan planning. There's a number of things that we have as requirements for planning that we think this information will support and uh, that you know that it will obviously be helpful as we think through our networks for bicycle and pedestrian planning transit and freight and that it can be used in urban areas as well as rural areas and lots of folks have been making some progress as we've heard on corridors or um, making progress on context sensitive solution projects or complete streets projects. And there's a chance to start scaling that up. And um, we're also working with AASHTO. We just came off a, a summit a couple of weeks ago, uh, trying to address safety issues across the country. And we presented all this information. And I think a number of recommendations will make its way into next steps that AASHTO will be working on with a number of their committees. And again, you've heard quite a bit of work on the uh, speed management. And what I wanna point out below, we're gonna have a really great session at TRB on January 7th for all of those of you that can make it to DC. Uh, there'll be a Sunday workshop from nine to noon and we hope to bring over some speakers from Australia to join our study team and have a really good three hour workshop. We can dive in and certainly use many of these questions that we may not get to today uh, but we can use those to help inform our uh, presentations at uh, TRB. Next slide. 
So we have here um, over 28 programs listed of discretionary funding and our formula fundings for Federal Highway, that all of which have eligibilities and opportunities right now with the bipartisan infrastructure law, additional funding for planning, for projects, uh, and lots of eligibilities that we hope you'll take advantage of to start thinking through how you can scale up, do pilots, uh, expand it, and um, start implementing some of this work. We, of course, internally are uh, looking to compile some funds from research and our program funds, and we look forward to, uh, as part of our implementation plan, listening to the needs that we're hearing about how we package some of this information and how we seed additional projects to uh, advance these examples and share them nationally. So I hope in the Q&A that folks can uh, start sharing some notes on progress that you've been making on the recommendations that you're hearing about. And if there's any needs that you have to uh, implement this work or expand this work, please let us know that, so that we can use that to inform our next steps for implementation. And uh, Dan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, we're we're excited to wrap up the series, but we're excited also to know that we're we're um, seeing more opportunities to to see this information coming about and and working on implementation of some of the lessons learned. So, um, I'd like to invite the panelists back um, to have a bit of a Q and A discussion session. I see that some of our panelists are firing off uh, responses to your questions in the chat. I really appreciate that too. Um, wanted to handle some of these big picture though, because they're they're big issues. Um, and Anna, I may start with you. Um, we really uh, were impressed by some of the work that you're working on and the things that are happening uh, where you are. Um, this question uh, has to do sort of big picture stuff as well. They're asking through New Zealand's speed limit paradigm shift, what was the driver compliance journey like? Um, they go on to ask how critical are the use of cameras and they note that public acceptance with uh, these types of camera systems, as as Lee and others have mentioned, is a bit mixed and varied across the United States. Um, but the driver compliance piece seems like a big issue. People may be wondering about maybe cultural differences between our countries and, and how we might think about implementing in a way that is uh, culturally relevant, but still will be effective. Um, thanks. Thanks, Dan. That's a, um, and thanks for who the person who submitted that question. It's a great question. Um, I think <clears throat> compliance is certainly a big concern in New Zealand as well. And it has, um, particularly, I think, for our engineers or people that have worked in this space for a long time, it has been a really big shift in our thinking to take an approach that's firstly led by safety rather than by compliance. And when we talk about an approach that's led by safety rather than compliance, what we mean is that rather than letting uh, concerns about potential compliance uh, issues be a barrier to getting that safe speed limit in as a foundation. We get the safe speed limit in first and then monitor what's happening with compliance and look at what we might need to do to further um, encourage compliance. For example, inputting, um, implementing safety cameras. And we've got really great data now that shows that in a lot of locations, in locations where we do put in safety cameras, we see a shift with the speed limit change, a, a smaller shift. And then uh, if we put a safety camera in on top of that, we see a further shift across in terms of where those mean speeds are. Um, but I think something really key to note for these discussions is that we know that even just changing the speed limit will start to get us a change in those operating speeds. And it will be relatively small. I think New Zealand um, is holding pretty strong, um, I think, similar to, to the international statistics, which is, you know, for uh, um, a 10 kilometre change in the speed limit, you might get an actual two or three kilometre change in your operating speed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's certainly not bringing it down to the full level of compliance. But the thing is that we also know that even relatively very small changes in operating speeds have substantially larger changes in safety. So, you know, the international research suggests that every 1% reduction in the mean speed, we could get a 4% reduction in fatal crashes um, and, a, you know, a 2 or 3% reduction in crashes overall. So, um, and, and in fact, when we've implemented change in New Zealand, we've actually seen that the, um, uh, the from a, from a, speed limit reduction, we're actually seeing a greater safety impact than the international literature would have suggested. So an example I often use when I talk about why we're safety led rather than compliance led would be getting changing the speed limit from 100 kilometers an hour to 80 kilometers an hour. And everyone might have actually been traveling at 90. So you might have had 
100% compliance. Everyone was traveling at 90. Change the speed limit to 80. Actually, let's do 95. Everyone was traveling at 95. Change the speed limit to 80. Every, the mean operating speed comes down to 85. So you've gone from 100% compliance to zero compliance, but you've got a reduction of nearly 10% in those operating speeds. And um, which of course can then potentially generate a 40, 50% reduction in deaths and serious injuries. So you now have a, although you're compliant, if you're judging just by compliance, you now have a significant compliance issue. You've actually had a dramatic improvement in safety. Um, so we're definitely not um, under under valuing the importance of compliance, but it's a secondary concern that we manage after we get that foundation in. Thank you, Anna. Um, this one uh, may have been intended for Anna, but but I actually wanted to see if uh, if Mark and and uh, Lee might weigh in because it it gets to the same topic of overcoming political and cultural barriers. Um, and, and you've illustrated such big changes have come about and likely encountered some of those. You've overcome them, but Mark and and Lee, um, in doing this work, hearing, seeing firsthand what's happening, and then thinking through what your agencies are doing to implement some of this work in the United States, how do, what strategies to overcome some of those political, cultural barriers um, do you think might be successful in, in your work to, to kind of shift the paradigm in this way? Um, I can go first, uh, perhaps. Um, I think that anything that we do uh, where we you can use data um, to show positive benefits is helpful. Um, so I mentioned that Virginia has authority now to do uh, speed safety cameras in school zones and in work zones. Um, I think that's a big opportunity to take um, the real uh, the real world experience there of, of how that goes, compliance, what the speeds do uh, when the cameras are, are present, um, and to use that as an educational opportunity and help build build momentum. Um, I find where we run into trouble is if, if we do something that, um, you know, we get questioned and then we don't really have anything to lean on. So I think a lot of what Anna was just talking about is helpful too. And like how you frame the conversation and how you start from safety versus, um, other, you know, other needs as well. Lee, did you have anything? Well, I was just going to echo that. I think data to back up what you're trying to do is, is so hugely important. Um, you know, we have to work with the current parameters that we have. What can we do within that? And then when we push it, not really push it by breaking the rules, but but do something that's maybe slightly unorthodox, how do we back it up? Right now, we're using a ton of delineators for either makeshift refuge islands or buffered bike lanes. And we're getting a little bit of pushback about, oh my God, where are these ugly plastic sticks all over the city? But we have data to show that the comprehensive costs have really dramatically decreased along these corridors with those ugly plastic sticks for a very small investment because they're really cheap compared to construction. So we're, we're still wrestling with this, but we can show it, you know, objectively, we are reducing crashes where we put these in and that will help us in the long run. Um, the, there were quite a few questions about the different types of automated enforcement and speed camera systems that are uh, available and have been studied in different parts of the world um, to be effective. And Anna, could you clarify, there were some questions about whether um, some of the systems are based on sort of looking at a speed that exceeds some level above the speed limit uh, and, and tickets based on that. And there were also some questions about some of the point to point uh, systems that look at average uh, speeds over distance. And I wonder if you could clarify, um, yeah, I'm sure you mentioned it, wh which types are being most used or do you have the most experience with or would say these are the ones that are giving us the best results? Thanks. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, under the Road to Zero strategy, there were three elements uh, of uh, the Tackling Unsafe Speeds program that was um, endorsed by our, our cabinet. So those were safe, uh, safety around schools, a new regulatory approach and framework, which is what I worked on, and then also a new approach to safety cameras. That's a, a, a big component as well. And so What's actually underway at the moment is a process in New Zealand to transition safety camera operation from the police uh, to um, the transport agency. So it's going to be brought in-house into our agency and substantially um, scaled up in terms of, of operations and reach. Um, as part of this new framework, I believe um, either a policy or a le I think actually a legislation change was made to allow point-to-point -point average speed cameras. Um, so those are going to bring in trials shortly. Um, and overall, the policy is to substantially scale up cameras and take an everywhere, anywhere, anytime approach to where a camera could be. 
Um, but mo and those cameras will mostly be um, signposted, not not covert. Um, we traditionally there has been a toler a, what's been called a tolerance of up to ten kilometres an hour um, on cameras or on police enforcement. But this has had a, a inadvertently, and to the great frustration of the police, this has had the impact of. Um, generating this sort of subconscious understanding in society that going 10 kilometers over is fine because it's allowed. Whereas we know actually it's significant because of that um, uh, relationship between speed and severity, we know that it, it has can have very, very significant impacts. So the police actually have a specific program now targeting that 10 kilometer um, group. And that's something they've had to change both within the police and their own understanding and their own focus. Um, and also is slowly changing with the public. So the message now is there is there is no tolerance. Um, when new cameras come in, they will be trialed. There will be a warning period where there won't be fines, um, but there is not a tolerance threshold anymore. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and uh, Anisha, I, I wouldn't miss an opportunity to ask uh, or clarify with you that the Speed uh, Safety Camera Program Planning and Operations Guide, would that be a good place for folks to look and get into more detail about some of these different types of systems and what's known and maybe what's recommended in the U.S. context? Yes and no. We do not actually have anything about point-to-point -point in yeah. that guide right now. Uh, it's something that we are lo looking, we're interested in. I know we have been, um, we would like to do a pilot at some point, but that's not something that's in the guide right now. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, and I, before we close out, we are a bit um, past our time. I um, appreciate you all sticking around. Uh, Lee wanted to plug a couple of other upcoming opportunities to dive into some of this material. Yeah, quick plug, because Cherry mentioned TRB, but we are also trying to organize a session for NACTO, the Designing Cities Conference, which I think is in Miami. I can't remember which month, but coming up this summer, as well as trying to present something at ITE, the National Convention, which we haven't finalized yet, but we're working on. So Great. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate uh, your attendance and this webinar and all the others in this series. We think it's been a really valuable discussion, a good way to share some of the lessons learned. But it, as uh, Sherry mentioned, it will not be the last opportunity to see what's going to come out of this and, and what might be implemented. Um, when you leave the webinar today, you'll find a link to or you'll be directed to a place where you can provide some feedback to us. I'm also going to place it here in the chat. Um, we do really value your, your feedback and your input and it'll help us shape some of the future offerings and ways that we may roll this information out. Um, so please do leave your comments there. Uh, you'll be emailed about the archive and where you can find that material. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, once more, thank you to all of our panelists who have participated in this entire series and for funding this work and, and really learning a great deal from uh, our friends in Australia and, and New Zealand and Anna um, joining us today and, and featuring that group. Um, we appreciate uh, the ability to learn and um, thank you all for your time. We hope to see you on future webinars and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.